All right. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, our spring webinar series for the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative. My name is Kristen Shaw, and I'm the Urban Conservation Coordinator for our LCC. Um, and I just am really excited that you all have joined us today. And apologize for the, the last minute webinar um, WebEx connection change. This is our last presentation of the, the webinar series, so uh, thank you for joining us. And today we'll have Nancy North from New Ground, and she's also the Watershed Leaders Network Lead for Fishers and Farmers Partnership for the Upper Midwest Mississippi River Basin. I think she has a longer name and title than I do, which is hard to say. Um, and she'll present on the um, Watershed Leaders Network. Uh, Nancy, I think we'll go ahead and pass the baton to you, and you can go ahead and start your presentation. Sounds good. Thank you. And hello to all. Um, I'm very happy today to be able to tell you about three years of work we've just completed and that we've come to see as success, successful. Um, a year, we took a year of inquiry and a year of developing programming and messaging and communications tools, and that led to developing the Watershed Leaders Network with and for fishers and farmers. Um, the network is a peer-to-peer -peer learning and action network for agricultural landowners and their local collaborators. The network is a program of Fishers and Farmers Partnership for the Upper Mississippi River Basin, which is one of the national fish habitat partnerships. The groups led by a natural resource and agricultural groups, including the Iowa Soybean Association, Minnesota Corn Growers, Wallace Pasture Project, um, which is a grazing organization from Wisconsin. From the beginning, the steering committee has made a true effort to listen to diverse viewpoints from across the region and to build connection across sectors. That's one of their core purposes. From the beginning, um, the steering committee made an effort to listen to diverse viewpoints and to build understanding. And here in this photo you see Co-chair Rod Ofte, who's a fourth-generation grass-fed beef farmer from Coon Valley, Wisconsin, sharing his work with Martin Conrad of Iowa DNR Fisheries and Adam Burr, who is director of Minnesota Corn Growers. Um, Rod's message here is that managed grazing is not only productive for him, but also the first-class brook trout stream you see flowing in the background. Rod says, we currently import 70% of grass-fed beef in America from overseas, so why not raise it here? Fishers and Farmers Partnership also funds farmer-led on-the-ground projects in all five states of the Upper Mississippi River Basin, including a cover crop pilot in the Pinot Creek watershed in northeast Missouri, shown here. Outreach components are always encouraged. Fishers and Farmers bring science to local work in agricultural watersheds. And it works to strengthen the ability of landowners to lead in their own home areas, neighbor to neighbor. So why focus on local leadership? We looked at agricultural communities across the Big Basin, places we know, and we saw power where landowners act and lead in their home areas. When a respected landowner makes a shift on the land that works, others follow, especially when that landowner instigates open and non-judgmental conversation about the practice and the place. We also saw that where farming neighbors got together to learn, plan, and make shifts all at once, positive things were happening. Some groups made big strides, though, but most struggled and made only marginal gains. So we asked ourselves, what do farmer-led groups need to succeed at the work? And that's where this whole project started. Focus, asking, and listening for many months made a number of social forces that were influencing farmer actions very clear. Things like challenging economics, risk aversion, and related focus on earnings. Fear of criticism for doing things differently, or fear of difficult conversations with neighbors. 
sensitivity, shame, and defensiveness that spring from divides in the larger culture are also evident. And there's often a lack of focus, um, distractions that can dilute a sense of urgency and a need, a real need for staff support to stay organized in the face of such a huge task that takes so long. There's also fatigue with traditional agriculture and conservation services um, and a related shift by the, on the part of farmers to work with commercial crop advisors who have many strengths but don't necessarily have the tools and background to develop farming plans that pay attention to water. There's a need among conservation-minded landowners, too, to see adoption and change speed up. The ones who are trying are working so hard, and it's discouraging to look at neighbors around who aren't doing the same. If landowners are aware but isolated, many stall out for lack of peer support and connection to a larger effort. Implementation is clearly in the hands of individual landowners, like these who were at our first workshop. But solutions can only be found in collaboration with others, because the situation is so incredibly complex. So we acted on what we saw. Um, seeing and hearing from the many, many people we deliberately asked, a need for peer connections, and a new way of connecting around the work, we developed two three-day workshops. The workshops invited members of locally-led watershed groups with strong farmer involvement. It was an experiment. Would time apart from routine, connection to peers, and a setting for, for exploration activate them and increase local leadership? There were 36 participants from 13 watersheds in five states. The majority were farming landowners, but we also had um, project coordinator, soil and water conservation district board member, crop advisor, a social worker, a League of Women Voters volunteer who was taking strong initiative in her area, an ag excavator, and a number of curious professional staff. And nine of the farmer leaders who came from five states came specifically to tell stories about their six successful watershed efforts. We met first where we could be on the river in an agricultural area at Eagle Bluff Environmental Learning Center. And then in November, participants shared their own work and we looked at the dynamics of the larger river basin at the amazing Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium in Dubuque. Our activities were built on conversational methods that draw on collective wisdom and the self-organizing capacity of groups. We drew largely from a suite of practices called Art of Hosting Conversations That Matter. Tracy Chaplin, who's a global Art of Hosting steward, co-developed the programming with me and played a key role in making the whole thing work. At the museum workshop, project leaders from several watersheds that have experienced some success shared their work. Here, participating groups share their places and work with each other at the museum. To anchor the network, we developed a website, including locally managed pages for core participating groups. We documented the workshops, and we learned from post-workshop surveys. A media list was developed, including all the participating groups across the Upper Mississippi River Basin. And stories were distributed to lift up the efforts of participants to educate and prompt local conversations. So these went to um, regional and a lot of local publications. So how do people respond? Well, all participants ask for more. Most say they'll pay for future workshops and related expenses. This was amazingly great news. Um, knowing they're part of a bigger effort gave them energy and purpose, and it has really motivated focused work since they returned home. 
They're going to each other's events, and they're presenting about their work and local activity to others. So in addition to the things they're doing at home, um, we learned a number of lessons, that just things we maybe had intuited before but became very, very clear as we listened to the stories and conversations and responses of the people involved. The first lesson was that it's incredibly important to acknowledge how complex this is. There was actual tangible relief in the room when we said out loud together that these are complex situations that require the knowledge and experiences of all to move forward on. Yeah, people get glazed over at times too, but there's a relief knowing that no one person has to have or will have the answer. We asked natural resources personnel who participated in our workshops to be themselves totally, but to arrive without any logos. This helps landowners see them as humans who don't have all the answers and not representing some large group and made it easier to work as equals. This Missouri farmer, John Scherter, was suspicious of me when we first met and suspicious of environmental groups overall. There's real, often justified suspicion, even among landowners who see the issue and are working for change already. The truth is, without knowing we're doing it, conservation personnel often are approaching projects as though we know the answer. None of us purposefully thinks, how can I twist the landowner's arm to make this happen? But that's sometimes how we approach our work. If we're true collaborators and partners, we might say instead, this is an important situation for all of us. Here's what we know. And then we ask, together, how can we make strong, long-term decisions for a stable landscape and community? Marcus Meyer and Dick Sloan are strong farmer leaders who created some success across their own watersheds in Illinois and Iowa. That's Marcus on the left and Dick on the right. Their stories reveal that they're clear about what they see, they're direct with invitations, they're persistent over time, they're curious, and they respect differences. So what can we learn from them? Terry Boxold, on, on the left in this photo, was both a Soil and Water Conservation District Director and a cattleman when he launched a large-scale effort in his Illinois watershed, Indian Creek. Marcus Meyer, on the right, is a quiet farmer who really wanted to make a difference. Together, they called on other respected landowners and community collaborators to lead the way. The listening we did before designing the workshops and the program really paid off. And during the program, we created many, many different situations where participants could really listen to each other. The processes we chose opened them and built trust in the group. Here, Wayne Salinsky, a crop advisor from Wisconsin, there on the right, talking with his hands, explains how on-farm realities play into his clients' decisions. A takeaway from this discussion is that it's important to know landowners' priorities and to speak from those priorities. During the workshop, um, and in this one, which we called the coffee shop, we watched the clock, but we found that these new peers were completely, completely engrossed in listening and always had another question for each other. It took time. And it reinforced that while we want this whole work to, to move faster, change only happens at the speed of the trust we earn. Because planning and effective facilitation is so incredibly important to success with group work, it's important to hire skilled staff. This is Tracy, who I mentioned earlier. It's important to budget for it, too, along with clear communications. It's work that really takes time. 
and it needs to be strategic to make it worthwhile. Here, teams from five states look at barriers to their local work. They brought their varied expertise and viewpoints to the table to identify their next local steps. This beautiful prairie strip on Tim Smith's farm in north central Iowa helped others in the workshop visualize one solution, prairie strips. Local teams drew on his story and photos to create their own vision for their own landscapes. Often we just need a clear focus on where we're going. And it needs repeating so we don't lose our way. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but it's something to commit to doing. Jeff Pape leads the successful local watershed group at Hewitt Creek in eastern Iowa. He says the group thrived when farmers learned and decided together what practices to use in their landscape, and then had money to distribute themselves to get the work done. When more strings are attached and funding diminished, momentum there slowed up. This scenario points to a need for trust between project partners in a simplified process, which we all know it's easier said than done, but it's well worth the investment of our time. It's super important to hire people who have both the desire and the skills to connect with landowners. It's also important to support those people in their roles so they hold up under a challenging task. We have to provide what's necessary to keep project managers in a place for an extended period of time so the relationships and projects they develop bear fruit. All people and the dynamics of each place are different, and diverse skills are needed. So what do we do? We must make time, create conversations that connect people, and recognize and draw on local knowledge so that long-term shifts on the landscape are more likely. It's not a movement yet, but we put this map together. We spent quite a bit of time looking in the upper Mississippi River Basin for all strong locally-led watershed groups that have strong farmer participation, and we mapped them here. Um, Landowners are becoming more active initiators across the basin, there's no doubt. And collaborative local projects are popping up. We're getting inquiries now after doing these workshops from people who've started to already to work in new ways and just want support. So why invest in people? Just last week, I got on the phone um, one day, and I called a number of the workshop participants from last year, and I asked what they're doing and if the workshops made a difference. And what they said really gave me hope. I've thought about it a lot since. They're doing things like scheduling local meetings that wouldn't have otherwise happened. They're asking for and using on-farm water test kits to know what the water quality is coming out of their tiles. And once they know, they plan to be able to talk about that with neighbors and encourage them to do the same. They're they are actually talking to neighbors. They're presenting to groups. They're organizing farmer advisory and leadership groups and teams. One of them was out talking with a legislator when I called. Others were scheduling field days. Some were working on their on-farm practices. One in Illinois was using an, an innovative new watershed planning process and had put together a farmer advisory council because of the workshop. They're drawing on the stories of peers to scale up action right where they are. And they're adapting what they learned from others to work in their own communities. They really, really came across strong in saying that it mattered to them to hear from people from other states because while not everything was sa the same, the landscapes may have been different, the community dynamics, they could pull out new ideas and fresh ways of thinking and apply it to where they are. There were a few people whose energy was waning, people who were already leading and starting to wonder if it was really going to make a difference. And coordinators in their group said that 
they're back at work, work full force. They're the first ones who are answering the emails. They're right out there, really believing in the work. And it's so exciting to us to see this. This is the kind of work, all these tasks that the landowners and the project coordinators in local places are taking on, this is the work that moves landscape changes to scale. And it's, it's worth our investment. The thoughtful words you see on the screen here were written by a southern Minnesota landowner. And they show to me the benefits of investing in the people who make change. Pat is a well-educated, successful farmer who was really tired by the realities of the issue when he arrived at the workshop back in August. Um, the gifts of time and focus, peers, shared knowledge, stories of success, new skills, reflection with his local group that wouldn't have happened in the same way at home were not soft things. They are really a powerful force for renewing his sense of purpose and sustaining the work in his watershed, which is actually one of the largest contributors of pollutants to the Minnesota River. So we land on um, this basic idea that local knowledge, invitations from local landowners and local decisions, combined with strong technical expertise, are absolutely necessary to create new norms that last on the landscape. Thank you. And I'm open to questions. Um, I, I, this is Carrie Lee, and I have a question about the facilitators. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how experienced were they in this kind of thing before? How what? <coughs> Excuse me, how experienced were they in this kind of multicultural sort of? Yeah, <laughs> actually, um, Tracy Chaplin is a global steward for Art of Hosting Conversations That Matter, which is a suite of practices that help communities address complex issues and build their shared work over time. Um, so she is very, very experienced. And I truly, I, she and I co-led the sessions. And while I do facilitating um, and I'm comfortable with that, I truly needed um, Tracy um, in this situation to design the kind of activities that would draw people out and build the kind of trust we planned on. Um, she is also able to kind of turn on a dime when she senses a need in the room or a shift that's happening. So I would say I would not discourage people from getting people together if you're not super experienced. But if you are uh, planning to do this, it, it can't be, to be anything but helpful to contact somebody who is very experienced with this kind of conversation. Um, it can be. It can be you know, we, we were conscious the whole time of really working, holding people's trust, earning people's trust, working with things that really matter to them, and wanting to do that with great care. So I have participated in local, local workshops like these we had only in a, in a sub-watershed um, that were quite large. And they had very well-trained facilitators. Um, but in that setting, too, this was incredibly helpful and powerful. It certainly changed many of the ways that I work after I attended. Yeah, so we're, um, we're, we just got a large grant to pull together a regional planning initiative. And I'm quite interested in maybe following up with you offline um, a, a little bit more about that. Sure, absolutely. You know, it's a little scary for all to have difficult conversations. And, and we all know that the issue of water can be volatile at times. And we all have such different perspectives um, and life experiences around it. So um, the hesitation we sometimes feel is probably valid, though we shouldn't get stuck there. I also think that 
the opportunity now for the, the sort of the environmental community and the producers to come together in a different way is um, shifting how we're going to work in the future. And I think this is um, a really big step in in making this work. It is, and we're really shifting um, strong systems. You know that um, you know we all know this. Just it's, there's so many elements, and it's so political, and um, it's it's easy to get stalled out. That's for sure. But we just can't. And I do really see a movement, and I see power coming out of this because. Um, when the landowners got in these workshops, got excited and and very purposeful. They were when they came, but as they gained even more confidence um, and skill from these, the agency people were really taking notice. I think it was shifting their minds too. Hi, this is uh, Andrew Stevenson. I just had a quick question. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting about the workshop where you asked everybody to come sort of without their logos. And <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if at any point you had a, a big reveal where everybody <laughs> sort of explained who they were and, and how people reacted to that. And I guess going along with that, um, what you can sort of translate for individuals where they don't have the opportunity to present themselves as not part of an agency and how they can get over some of those barriers. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, actually, we, it, it was, actually, it wasn't a, a, it didn't take long to reveal it and it wasn't a huge secret. It just was that we weren't literally labeled um, when we came in, or anybody was. Um, because you know, I didn't want people to be fake. We wanted complete authenticity. Um, we wanted people to be honest. And naturally, when they introduced themselves, they told what they do. Um, some maybe mentioned their agencies. Some just talked about their roles in the beginning. Um, but it became very helpful to be that honest, but also just not to. I, there's a dichotomy there, I know, but. Um, you know, we were talking about how to get things done, so naturally people who work on the technical side brought their expertise to the conversation. Um, but it does make a difference. I've even noticed this in when I've gone to hearings or meetings in my own watershed. When NRCS or um, pollution control agency folks or others arrive without wearing their uniforms, um, even if people maybe know who they are, not everybody does, um, you can hear in their voices and what they say what their expertise is. But it, it tends to create an openness. It, it tends to put us on a human-to-human -human level a little bit easier. It seems it's a, such a small thing, but it really did make a difference. Thanks. I'd say in our experience here through talking with farmers, um, I mean, I think that logo can be, it, like you're saying, it can be helpful or hurtful in terms mm -hmm. of it can either add a lot of credibility to an agency and, you know, sort of have that inherent respect or acknowledgement of someone's, you know, professional skills. Mm -hmm. um, and so having maybe some of those ag production groups on it, um, like the Soybean right. Association or, yeah. you know, other crop advisors is, is really important when you're trying to get these projects going to get farmers who aren't fully conservation-minded engaged right away. Um, but yeah, so I thought that was a really interesting way to start the workshop, so that was, that was great. Still borrowing? Let me see. Hopefully they can hear me. Anybody else? Um, there was, in the notice for this webinar, um, it said that you were going to talk a little bit, Nancy, about how we can get involved. Um, <laughs> you know, I saw that, and, and I... I was like, is that 
how we can get involved in this partnership or the network. Um, I'm quite. Well, I didn't see that description actually till this morning, and I honestly can't promise you how to get involved in this particular partnership right now. Um, I can tell you, Fishers and Farmers um, each year awards uh, receives um, applications for funding for projects that are farmer-led in targeted areas, and that information is always posted on their website, typically posted in the late summer, early fall, and then the review is done um, usually at the beginning of late October, early November. Um, so that you can certainly take advantage of if you go to fishersandfarmers.org. Um, related to these particular workshops, as I said, this was a pilot. Um, it was a two-year, we had two-year funding for it. We're at the end of our funding cycle right now and having conversations with the funder about what's next. And we're actually working to really look at how this can fit into other efforts in the basin to make it stronger, to make it more effective, to further bring people together. And I don't have answers on how that's going to look right now. Um, so I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> um, we certainly plan, hope to keep offering these workshops again. And if you go to fishersandfarmers.org and sign up on the email sign up, there will definitely be some sort of announcement made about how this will look in the future and how people can get involved, and you could receive that by email. I would say, though, um, right now each of the, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, each of the groups has a page on the Fishers and Farmers website. Um, as the program grows, we hope, um, the, each new group will also have a page, and we have taught the local groups to update those, their own pages. So um, that's something that could be in the offing also. But you can also go to those pages and just kind of take a look at what people are doing and use those as a way to, to connect with other groups that are farmer-led. Um, the diversity in the groups is just incredible. Um, and even just reading those pages now is, to me, fascinating. One of the groups was actually uh, the watershed effort is being led by the League of Women Voters in Galena, Illinois. And uh, another group represented there, Mill Creek in Wisconsin, it was absolutely, completely started by some young farmers who just wanted to do it different and do it better. And they actually went to Extension and asked for support. Um, so they're kind of coming at it full steam from another angle. Um, some are more um, NGO or agency supported. So um, I guess at this point, all I can say is that you can learn from the website. You can certainly reach out and contact the people in the groups that are represented in those local pages. Um, they are actually communicating with each other and, and being open to helping each other. So, and, and Fishers and Farmers Coordinator Heidi Coiler um, who's with Fish and Wildlife Service in, on Alaska, Wisconsin, or I would be very happy to talk with you at any point. I'm sorry I can't offer more right now. Yeah, that, that's okay. I'm, um, I think partly the funder that we have um, working for our initiative um, also, I'm assuming it might be the same funder, the McKnight Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and they, um, they have encouraged us to, because we are working with the Galena group. I'm from oh, okay. Yeah, with the Joe Davies Conservation Foundation and the Galena group is one group that we're working with. So um, I'd really like to talk to you afterwards. Sure, I'd love that. Particularly as you're looking at how you can fit into other efforts in the basement, basin, and uh, that's one of our, our um, goals as well. Okay. What's the name of your project? Um, it's the Northwest Illinois. Um, it, it's really a strategic land and water planning plan that okay. we want to put together because 
in the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, um, there's really, it hasn't been spelled out that um, land protection or some of these other things that land trusts do, we're, we're um, an environmental land trust, uh, can be one of the tools uh, that can be used. So we're looking to say, how can we, as land trusts, fit into this whole package with um, producers and uh, agencies and other not-for-profit, other groups? Wow, well, that sounds exciting. Yeah, we've got two funders funding this project, we just found out. We've got the grants, and we're going to be moving forward in the next couple of months, so. Hmm. Yes, we should talk. Yes, let's talk. You know, are you familiar with Leadership for Midwestern Watersheds? Also, the workshop that's been held maybe four times, once I a year? I haven't been to that, no. Um, they are also, it, it, several organizations have sponsored these workshops, but I found them, I went to the, for the first time last year, and I found it incredibly helpful, and I know they're um, thinking about some of the same things you are also. Does anyone else have any questions for Nancy before we um, close this webinar? No questions, but thanks very much for your presentation. It's very informative and, and uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, so much for your presentation today. And um, thank you all for calling in to this uh, webinar series that we've had um, this spring. Uh, if you have any questions that you didn't get to for Nancy or for any of the other presentations that we've done the past few weeks, um, you can find all the contact information for every presenter on our website, tallgrassprairielcc.org. Uh, um, you can also email me, abby underscore donnelly at fws.gov for any questions about any of the webinars we've had, any of the recordings. Um, if you're interested in doing uh, a webinar later in the year, um, please let us know. This was a really great opportunity for us to to spread um, all the great work that our partners are doing. Um, and I think it was really successful. So thank you for um, thank you for joining us these past few weeks and until the next webinar series. Um, have a great day.